Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Kristen Talbot. I'm the program manager for Maven Project. Thank you all for joining us today and our friends at Brevard Health Alliance for hosting today's session, Cancer Screening, a Primary Care Approach with Dr. Carrie Horwich. Dr. Horwich is an outpatient primary care physician. She's been in practice for over 30 years. For 20 years, she worked with the Virginia Mason Medical Center Internal Medicine Residency Program as an associate program director and key clinical faculty. She's a clinical associate professor of medicine at University of Washington, Seattle. Dr. Horwich was the governor for the Washington chapter of American College of Physicians from 2010 to 2014 and served on the American College of Physicians Board of Regents from 2014 to 2018. She's currently a member of the Board of Trustees for Washington State Medical Associ Association. And we're just so very lucky to have her as a Maven Project volunteer. With that, I will bring up Thank you so much, Kristen, and welcome everybody uh, to this presentation. Uh, once we get the slides in the slideshow mode, I'll get started. So as this slide says, um, this is going to be hopefully a useful primary care approach to cancer screening, which is a very, very big topic. Um, and so each one of the cancer screening that we have, I'll try to go into some of the data, what some of the guidelines show using cases to do that. Um, I would also encourage you to please put questions into either the Q&A or the chat. I probably will take questions after sort of each section and then also at the end. So I'll try to leave some time for that. Why don't we uh, skip ahead a couple of slides. You've already heard about the CME and the accreditation. <clears throat> so what we're going to do today is we're going to review some of the current guidelines for cancer screening. And I want to remind people that cancer screening guidelines typically are to assess asymptomatic average risk persons. So there are different criteria for people who are symptomatic, which moves from screening more to diagnostic workup. And then there are people that are higher risk, which also has a little bit different screening guidelines. So I wanna be very clear that today's talk is really gonna kind of talk about the people who come into your practice every day, they should be asymptomatic and they are average risk. Uh, the five screening uh, cancers that I'm gonna talk about are cervical, colon, lung, breast, and prostate. I also wanna discuss a little bit about, well, when should we stop screening? Um, some high value uh, practices, and then also a little bit about the sort of benefits, the harms, and some of the limitations of the screenings uh, that we have. So next slide, please. And so just to give a general overview, so we know that cancer um, is very common and it is probably uh, some of the top diagnoses for chronic diseases um, for not only cases, but also mortality. And so if you sort of look at this list between just male and female, for men, you can see that prostate cancer is the highest cancer. It is not the number one cause of death. That would be lung cancer. Uh, but then colon cancer and then other cancers after that. For women, of course, breast cancer is the most common, but again, not the most common one that causes death. That is lung cancer, as well as colon cancer. So you can kind of see that the top three cancers, uh, one is very specific to the gender at birth, and then the other two are actually more generic. Um, and again, there are many things that people could do health-wise to try to prevent cancers um, and things like that. Next slide. And then again, as you can see um, for death, as I mentioned, lung cancer, number one for both men and women. Um, and women actually rose that to the top, mostly because of increased smoking um, among women. Um, next slide, please. And what about survival rates? So if... Um, and I, and I put this up for two reasons. One, to show that survival rates have actually improved for many cancers. Um, partly that is due to screening, partly that is due to better treatments, um, early recognition, getting people on appropriate therapy. But I also put this slide up here to show that not all people are equal in terms of their survival rates. And I think that has more to do with um, social determinants of health, uh, screening, getting access to care, getting on appropriate treatment. And so I think we need to be mindful 
that we really should be making sure that screening applies to everybody. Um, and some people may need to have more screening based on um, history, family history, and things like that, because we can improve the survival rates um, for everybody. Next slide. <clears throat> so when we think about screening, and I think it's really important because sometimes um, clinicians don't always understand why we're doing it. And I specifically think patients don't really understand. So what we are trying to do with screening is to detect a cancer, preferably in a preclinical phase. And so that is identifying potential cancer that may cause death of somebody if it goes undetected and untreated. And that's partly how screening criteria are developed is to find there are cancers that if we detect them early, like cervical cancer or colon cancer with precancer, and we treat that, we can prevent that from becoming a cancer. Um, that would sort of be number one. The other thing we are trying to do is potentially find cancer in its very, very early stage where the um, the idea of curing that cancer is far more likely than if we're finding something later stage, um, like stage three or stage four. We also need the criteria that early treatment is much more beneficial than waiting for the cancer to become clinically apparent, which for many cancers is not until very, very late stage. And we also want to see that there is a mortality benefit that by identifying it, treating it early, we actually improve survival and that survival time frame is 10 years and that the benefit outweighs the harm. We clearly do not wanna be causing more harm to a lot of people who don't have cancer um, just to find one cancer in somebody who does. So the benefit has to outweigh the harm. And then always in medicine, they talk about cost effectiveness and there are many, many um, equations for how that's figured out. And again, most of the criteria we come up with are cost effective. And just remember that if a patient has any symptoms, it becomes a diagnostic workup, not screening. That is important not only for the patient to get the appropriate test, it is also important for billing um, because it is not a screening at that point. If somebody, if a woman comes in and they say, my breast hurts or I, have, I feel a lump, you are moving to a diagnostic workup at that stage. It is not screening. Next slide, please. So let's start with our cases. Let's start with case one. We're going to start with cervical cancer, which I think is probably the easiest of the cancer screening. Um, so we have a 19-year-old sexually active female um, coming in for her annual exam. Uh, and so what follow-up should she need? So if people just want to write in the chat, does she need a PAP with or without the HPV, chlamydia screening, and HIV? Does she need a PAP with the HPV, chlamydia, HIV? Does she need a PAP without HPV or chlamydia, or does she just need chlamydia screening, HIV, and uh, the HPV vaccine? So if you want to type into chat what people think. All right. So I'm not going to belabor this because you are all correct. So clearly she's 19. She does not net yet need PAP screening, but she definitely needs um, STI screening, and that would be chlamydia HIV and any other STI that might be reasonable, that could be gonorrhea and syphilis. And yes, if she has not been vaccinated for HPV, this would be an ideal time for that. Next slide, please. Okay, second cervical case. 33-year-old um, comes in for routine annual exam. Her last pap was three years ago and she told you it was normal. So when should her next pap be? And again, type into chat, should she get it today? She's in your office, three years, five years, or I don't really know. Okay. I see some people typing into the chat and a little bit different here. So I think the real answer here is, well, we don't really know because it actually depends on what she had done three years ago. Um, and so that is something that we would need to ask. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, and one more cervical case. 68-year-old, um, originally from Somalia. 
She presents for routine health care. She doesn't bring any records. She doesn't recall if she has been screened previously. She otherwise appears healthy and is not having any concerns. And what is the recommendation for cervical cancer screening for her? Again, please type into the chat. She doesn't need it because she is over a certain age. She should get PAP today with or without HPV. Go for colposcopy or do HIV testing and then decide. Okay, so a couple people are typing into chat. Most of you are saying the correct thing, which is she absolutely needs to get a pap test, probably with HPV testing if you have that available. And uh, let's go to the next slide and let's talk about why these things are. So here's the current screening guidelines. And again, remember this is for average risk individuals. So this is not patients living with HIV. They are higher risk. Um, so average risk individuals. Um, there are different screening guidelines, as always with almost all of these. American Cancer of Society uh, does not say to screen women or women who st or people who still have uh, cervix and uterus. Um, says not to screen between 21 to 25. The U.S. Preventive Task Force, however, does recommend screening with PAP every three years. Um, from age 25 to 65, there are a couple different options, and all of these are validated, um, and it may depend on where you are, what resources you have available to you. Um, so if you have it set up where you do PAP with HPV testing, if it's negative, it's every five years. So remember, this is average risk negative. Once you get a positive test, then you move towards different algorithms for when you screen again. And you can look those up um, on the guidelines, U.S. Preventive Task Force and others. ACOG also has them for what happens with a positive cervical cancer, PAP, or HPV. Um, so you could do just HPV, HPV with the PAP, or a PAP every three years. Okay, so you can kind of see that. Now, the over 65 for any of the guidelines, they do not recommend screening, assuming that those women have had regular PAP cervical cancer screening and that you have at least two or three negative PAPs before you stop. So our high risk uh, over 65 woman from Somalia who we don't know if she ever had screening needs to continue screening, and that screening would probably continue even past 70 to make sure that we get a, at least two to three negative tests for her. Um, if someone did have a high-risk cervical neoplasia, then they need to keep getting screened up to 25 years after their diagnosis. So that means if a woman was diagnosed at, say, 50 with high-risk CIN or cervical cancer, they keep getting screened until they're at least 75, okay? And then those who have had a uh, abdominal or vaginal hysterectomy and do not have a cervix, and it was taken out for non-cervical cancer reasons, you do not need to keep screening those individuals. Next slide, please. Okay, so just a little bit about the death rate. Um, again, as you can see, and I put this up just to show that there is also disparity in each cancer specifically. And again, um, Black and non-Hispanic uh, Native American have much higher rates of death. And a lot of that is because they may not have been screened. They don't get appropriate screening. Maybe they don't have appropriate follow-up. So again, making sure that everybody gets screened appropriately and appropriate follow-up. Next slide. So what about stopping cervical cancer screening? So there's a lot of data to say, well, why don't we keep screening anyways? And really the risk of cervical cancer as women get older, if they have had ongoing screening and are negative, is very, very low. That probably the benefits really don't outweigh um, the harms of ongoing screening, the trauma, uh, the discomfort. Um, if a woman is having issues, bleeding, pain, then it would be wise to take a look and do appropriate 
testing and screening at that point. Next slide. And again, most of the women who do end up with cervical cancer or high grade, um, if they are over age 60, either had no PAP or actually had abnormal PAPs in the past and did not get appropriate follow-up or treatment. Next slide. And then um, here's just a study that shows that um, women who have had benign findings uh, for having a uh, abdominal hysterectomy, um, there were zero cancers identified. And so again, if somebody has had um, a hysterectomy and no cervix, cervix removed, for benign reasons, they really do not need to keep getting tested with PAP and HPV. Next slide. And so I did put in the link and you will be getting these slides. So if an HPV or PAP is abnormal, uh, that is the link uh, to some of the management guidelines. So you can look that up. Uh, and that's a much bigger topic um, for today. And remember that um, the guidelines are risk-based, uh, not so much algorithm-based. So please look those up. And again, you may need to refer to gynecology for colposcopy or other evaluations or treatment and management. Next slide. Okay, so main cervical points for cervical. Again, I would say start, certainly definitely start screening by age 25. Again, U.S. Preventive Task Force says by age 20, start with at age 21. There are multiple ways to screen, and it depends on, um, it's helpful to have the same screening each time so you can follow it. Um, and again, you can stop at age 65 or older, assuming no prior cervical cancer, high-risk CIN, HIV, and they've had regular screening. Okay. Um, and if there's any questions on cervical cancer, can you put them in the chat before I move to the next screening? I'll wait a minute, or in the Q&A. And Kristen, I don't think there's anything in the Q&A, correct? No. Okay. Okay, I'm not seeing anything pop up. Um, let's move to the next slide then. If, if you have questions, you can keep putting them in the chat if I'm not a fast typer, so that's fine. Okay, we're gonna move to colorectal cancer next. Um, and as I mentioned, it's the third leading cause of cancer related deaths in both men and women in the United States. Um, we have seen some uh, declining uh, per year, and I think that is actually due uh, twofold, both to better screening, different screening tests, as well as earlier detection and uh, better treatments. Um, again, there's a 5% lifetime risk of colorectal cancer in the United States, and the majority of these individuals are over 50, which is how we got our initial guidelines, but we are finding some earlier cancers now, so the guidelines have changed. There is a risk assessment calculator, which you can use if you want to. And I gave you the link for that. Again, that may be helpful if you're not sure. Does this, is this person maybe at higher risk? Should I screen earlier? Next slide, please. And again, just going, um, I always want to point out that there are differences uh, in our country between um, the races. And again, um, non-Hispanic Blacks uh, have higher rates of colon cancer, as do our Native American populations. Next slide. So let's start with our first case. So a 46-year-old male comes in for his annual exam. And which of the following do you think is appropriate for him for colorectal cancer screening? Uh, we can do the, so FOBT is fecal occult blood test. Uh, the FIT is fecal immunochemical test. So those are both stool tests. Um, flexible SIG now in every five years, colonoscopy now in every 10 years, or all of the above. Okay, so I'm seeing a lot of people type in that all of the above. Yes, I would say that any of these are potential. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Okay, our next case, 75-year-old male. He's got history of congestive heart failure, coronary artery disease. He comes in for his Medicare wellness visit, and he asks about colon cancer screening. He did have a previous colonoscopy um, that was normal, and what is the current recommendation? So should we repeat colonoscopy because his last one was 10 years ago? He does not need it anymore. 
uh, depends on risk benefit before deciding, or it depends on his overall health and prognosis. So if you just want to type your thoughts into the chat real quickly. Okay, I'm going to keep moving along just because we have a lot to cover. Um, I would say probably D might be the right answer here, although you could make a case for either B, C, or D, um, depending. Um, and there is data to show that, again, I mentioned that 10-year mortality benefit for cancer screening. So we have to look at that as we reach our older individuals or those with a lot of comorbid infection or diseases um, that could be life-limiting for those patients. Next slide. All right, so the new guidelines um, now say to start screening at age 45. And again, this is average risk. You start earlier if somebody has a first degree relative who has had colon cancer and you do it at least 10 years before the diagnosis of that cancer. So if somebody in someone's family was diagnosed with colon cancer at 40, then, and it's a first degree relative, that individual needs to start their screening at age 30. And I would say preferably with colonoscopy um, because that may be a much higher risk individual and you really wanna try to get the test that's gonna give you the most information and be able to do any procedure if they find something at that time. So lots of screening tools available and I'm also gonna present a slide on a new thing that I just saw. Um, that got approved. So colonoscopy, um, and again, that certainly would be the preferred method for the higher risk individuals. Uh, you could do annual, um, the fecal immunochemicals, so the stool test, it is annual. There's a lot of discussion about that, but most of us in primary care, if we're going to use the stool-based, the one that you just hand out in your clinic, the little packet that they have to do, um, every year. Not a lot of those get returned, so that's one of the issues with it. There's the stool DNA, which the trade name for that is Cologuard, um, and that is typically every three years. More insurance is starting to cover that, so hopefully the cost of that will come down. Flexig could be every five years, so remember Flexig is still a procedure. You still need to do the prep, uh, but it doesn't go all the way, um, and I'll talk about a couple, a new thing later. Um, and it's a if you do colonoscopy, then the screening is every 10 years, assuming it is normal. And depending on if they find polyps, what they find, the screening timeline may be shortened. And it depends on what they find, how big, how many will determine when the next screening may be due. And that would probably would be then with colonoscopy again. Next slide, please. Um, there was a question in the chat, if all we have is Cologuard, is that okay? Absolutely okay. Um, there is data to show that, that it, there's no randomized control trials for the stool DNA, but yes, it is approved um, and it is acceptable. Um, and a lot of practices are starting to use that. It's a little easier. So there's kind of two parts to that test if people do it correctly. So it may be a little bit more sensitive up for identifying abnormalities. Remember, for any test that is not a colonoscopy or Flexig, uh, if you get a positive test, you must go on to one of the other tests, typically colonoscopy. You get a positive FOBT or FIT or, or Cologuard test, you have to go on to colonoscopy, okay? You need to look to see, is it a polyp? Is it a precancer? Is it cancer? So don't, you cannot stop at just doing that and saying, oh, it's positive. I'll just repeat it in a year. They need to go on uh, to other testing. So some of the screening measures. So again, FOBT and FIT. Um, again, most people, if they do use the stool test in their clinic, they're using the FIT, uh, which probably has a little bit better sensitivity because um, it detected two or more cancers. And again, most people have those packets. If they have them, the MA can kind of put the labels on and give them to patients. 
or if you do the stool DNA, which again, right now the trade name is Cologard, um, and they may come out with other ones. Um, you can also give that. That typically gets mailed uh, to a patient. Um, I don't know if you have them in your clinic. If you do, then you must have some way to get that back because typically that gets mailed in and then the patients uh, get the result as does the clinician. Um, again, Flexig has some large prospective studies showing a reduction. And remember, a number needed to screen to prevent one colon cancer death, 850, which is well within um, you know, what we look at for um, appropriate screening guidelines. Next slide. Um, the fecal DNA, again, trade name Cologuard. Um, good sensitivity specificity for both detecting colorectal cancer, that's what CRC means, or even adenoma precancers. So if you can see that pretty high sensitivity and specificity, um, it is expensive. I believe the cost is probably coming down because more people are using it. And insurance is starting to cover it more than it did in the beginning. Um, it is included on the ACS guidelines uh, and likely is going to be included when they revise the guidelines again. Um, again, remember, if it's positive, still need colonoscopy. Next slide. Okay, so colonoscopy, even though that is sort of the, what I would call the gold standard for colon cancer screening, we don't have randomized controlled trials that evaluate reducing morbidity and mortality. But we do have a lot of case control studies, population-based studies that show a 61% reduction in distal colon cancer and a 22% in proximal. So remember, that's the difference between colonoscopy and Flexig. Colonoscopy gets the whole colon and Flexig only goes part of the way. Um, and so again, there are advantages, which you've mentioned, with a good prep and a good uh, GI or diagnostician doing this study. Um, they can detect and remove polyps and usually visualize the whole colon. Some of the disadvantages for anyone who's ever had it done, uh, the prep, not very fun. Um, there can be bleeding, perforation. You have to take time off the day of the procedure uh, because you are sedated and it is very operator dependent on it. Next slide. And here's the newest thing. I just saw this in one of my journals, a cell-free DNA blood test. So remember part of the reason why colon cancer screening has not found everybody who is at risk is because people don't really complete the tests. They, you give them the stool test, they don't do it. You try to get send them the Cologuard, they don't do it. You set them up for a colonoscopy or flexid, they don't go. Um, so a blood test would be a lot easier. And this was recently approved. Um, this was based on a study, uh, and this is from New England Journal. It was recently published a few months ago. Um, and what they found is um, they looked at over 7,000 uh, individuals um, and those who had colon cancer, the study was able to be positive in 83% of them, okay? And CFDNA just means cell-free DNA. But close to 17% had a negative test, even with colon cancer. So it had a pretty good sensitivity for advanced cancer, but it was terrible, in my opinion, for pre-cancer. When we look at some of the other studies, that are a little better for precancer as well, adenomas. So um, it's if if it becomes part of the guidelines and if it is available and if it is, you know, cost-wise appropriate, it may be helpful to find somebody who has colon cancer. Chances are they may have more advanced colon cancer than we would like. Um, but again, this is not yet in the guidelines. It literally just got approved. So you have to think about that. And I don't know what insurance is going to do with this or how expensive it will be. And I gave you the um, reference there for that article um, who did the study. Next slide. All right. So what about elderly? So I gave you that case of the patient who had a normal colonoscopy 10 years ago. Uh, he's got some comorbid uh, diseases. And um, what do we do? So we know most cancers increase with age, but does that mean we should keep screening into elderly age? And I think this is where 
it is very hard sometimes to know what to do. Um, depending on how old or young, and I say that in quotation marks, uh, is really irrelevant. I would say age is a relative factor. I would say it really is their function, their comorbid, and are you going to get benefit, a 10-year mortality benefit by screening somebody in the elderly population? And there are a lot of different ways people do that. There are frailty tests you can do. And again, those that are more frail, um, you know, which could even be a walk test, uh, unlikely to get mortality benefit by screening them. And so you could save them the trauma of having to undergo a screening. Does it mean you may miss somebody who develops a cancer? It does, but you could miss that anyways, even with all of our screening tests. Um, next slide, please. Um, and again, there are case controlled studies. Lower endoscopy usually means uh, flexig. Um, and again, they included pretty wide range of older people. And again, colon cancer mortality was reduced and it was independent of age. So again, I really think age is not the issue. I think it is frailty and other illnesses uh, as to whether or not somebody may benefit from ongoing screening. Next slide. Okay, so this kind of brings us up as to, well, when do we stop then? And there are, again, differences in the guidelines as usual. So let's pull up the next slide. So the U.S. Preventive Task Force recommends against routine screening, but it's C, which means talk about it. Uh, nobody recommends screening in the over 85. Next slide. ACS and ACG really don't didn't put in any recommendations for when to stop. ACS is American Cancer Society. ACG is American uh, uh, Cancer of Geriatrics. Uh, not geriatrics, gastroenterology, sorry. Next slide. Um, again, geriatric society, uh, don't screen if the life expectancy is less than three to five years. Part of the problem with that is clinicians are really bad prognosticators, and we don't really know if somebody has a less than five-year life expectancy unless they're really, really ill. Next slide. American College of Physicians says don't screen at age by age 75 or greater, or if their life expectancy is less than 10 years. Next slide. And American uh, Academy of Family Practice, same as U.S. Preventive Service Task Force. Next slide, please. So let's look at some of the caveats. So yes, you find more cancers if you keep screening, Is that's that top line. So again, cancer goes up with age. So yes, you're gonna find more cancers, but if you look at that second line, what you do is this is the amount of years of life gained by finding that diagnosis. And if you can see the 75 to over 80, you're really not adding a huge amount of life gained, okay? Less than two months uh, when you look at that. So again, it is a discussion to have with your patient. Next slide. And what are some of the risks? So there are a lot of adverse risks, especially with the C-scopes. Perforation, next slide. And again, the risk will go up with age and comorbidity. Again, sedation if they're getting colonoscopy. Um, and again, remember if you do um, colon cancer screening with any other form um, like the FIT or the fecal DNA um, and it's positive, you still need colonoscopy. Now, again, this does not mean if someone comes in with bleeding um, from the GI tract that is a different situation. You're moving into diagnosis. Uh, why are that bleeding's coming from? That is no longer screening. Next slide. Okay, so some of the key points, again, definitely start screening now by age 45 and earlier if they are higher risk. A lot of different options. That's gonna be shared decision-making, cost, what's available, what's easiest for your patient preference. Um, when you repeat screening, depends on what method you're using. We really wanna to continue to try to reduce bias and barriers for screening in uh, our populations. Consider stopping screening over age 75 and definitely probably don't screen over age 85. Next slide. Um, so I wanna ask, are there any questions on colon cancer before I move to lung?
Okay. Um, keep writing them in chat. I think I'm just going to keep going for sake of time. We know lung cancer, leading cause of death, both men and women in the United States. Most important risk factor, you all know it, smoking. And that contributes to 85% of lung cancers. Um, I'm not going to go into all the statistics. You can look at this later. Next slide. Um, so let's go to our case. A 65-year-old male, former smoker, 23 pack years by history. He quit 10 years ago. Uh, family history of coronary artery disease. What is the appropriate screening for him? So does he need PSA, a fit or colonoscopy, CT chest for lung, or an abdominal aortic, or all of the above? I'm just going to keep going on. Next slide. Uh, 50, this is a different case, 50-year-old current smoker, 35 pack years, no desire to quit. He just heard about this screening thing and wants to know what you think. And so the question is, should he have screening or not? Okay, so the answer to our first case was all of the above are appropriate to somebody who's been a smoker. They should have both prostate, lung, colon, screening, and they need at least a one-time uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm ultrasound. Uh, if they're 65 or above, that's not part of cancer screening, but I'm throwing that in anyways. Um, so anybody who's been a smoker over a certain and gets to 65, if they've had a certain number of pack years, should have a one-time uh, AAA uh, evaluation. Next slide, please. All right, so we've got, again, um, some different guidelines, but most of them, U.S. Preventive Service Test Work recommends annual screening with low-dose CT. And the criteria are a minimum of 20 pack year smoking history. Um, if they are either a current smoker or have quit in less than 15 years, they are between the ages of 50 and 80, and they have a life expectancy of greater than 10 years. It also is important to know, are they willing to undergo any treatment um, for surgery, um, either surgery or any other treatment? And again, so it's a discussion to have with your patients. Uh, most EHRs have a little template, a dot phrase that you can stick in for lung cancer screening that gives you all these criteria so that it gets paid for, and then you order your low-dose CT scan. Next slide. Um, again, some of the data have shown, and this is some of the data as to how these guidelines got approved, um, showed that they did detect more lung cancers, and you want to try to find it early um, so we can actually impact mortality. Um, and if you do the low dose CT, so not a chest X-ray, I want to repeat, chest X-ray is not a screening test for lung cancer. You have to get the low dose CT. You're looking for early um, adenomas, lesions, small cancers. Uh, chest X-ray is not good enough. Um, obviously, there are harms if you find something and then you go to surgery to biopsy and it turns out being benign, that does carry risk. Uh, for the procedure. Next slide, please. Um, the National Lung Screening Test, again, another larger study um, and showed, again, benefits. So they st so the guidelines actually started at 30 pack years smoking, but recent data showed to drop that smoking pack years to 20. And the number needed to screen to prevent one lung cancer death, 320. So this is actually even better than colon cancer for screening. It's probably an underutilized a screening tool that's partly because of cost, access, uh, and a lot of other reasons. Um, so it is something to really discuss with your patients um, because, again, if we can find lung cancer early, we can actually impact mortality. Next slide. Um, and here's why you don't do uh, chest X-ray screening. As you can see, um, chest radiograph really um, does not prevent death. Um, you could argue that low-dose CT scan um, is better and you can see the difference, uh, it's obviously not perfect. Next slide. Okay, and again, just a different study. Um, I'm gonna move on uh, just because these are basically say, sort of the criteria that um, convince us why we should do the screening. Next slide, please. But you can, you'll can you have these slides later. So what do we do? Well, first and foremost, obviously, is try to get people to stop smoking, do motivational interviewing. That is the most important intervention, especially if we can get people to quit before they reach those 20 pack year histories. 
Um, again, you need to determine how many pack years they smoked and then discuss that. And it should be annually up to age um, 80 if they're willing to um, get screened and get treatment. <clears throat> Some of the things we don't know about yet, we don't know yet risk of vaping. We don't know if that carries the same risk as other smoking. We also don't know if smoking cannabis or anything else um, also carries a risk for lung cancer. So that's still an unknown um, for us. Okay, next slide. Excuse me. One second. Okay. Um, breast cancer screening, second leading cause of cancer death in women. Mammogram is still the primary screening tool. I get asked that sometimes, should we do MRIs or ultrasounds? The answer is MRI and ultrasound are not initial screening tests. They may be adjunct tests or tests done with those at higher risk. And so there actually have been several randomized trials showing improvement. <laughs> and we have seen, excuse me, mortality decrease and I think, again, that's both due to screening, identifying people, as well as better treatments. A lot of risk factors for breast cancer. Family history, the BRCA genetic abnormalities, alcohol, actually. And that is probably an under-recognized um, discussion uh, to have with your patients is drinking um, one alcoholic beverage a day increases your risk of breast cancer drinking more increases it by a significant percentage, okay? Like 10, 15, 25%, okay? Um, there were studies that showed that hormone replacement or menopausal hormone therapy um, increased. But again, I think that data is getting downplayed now, looking at that data a little better. And you can certainly um, ask for our menopause talk um, to go into that in more detail. Um, uh, having a larger BMI, also a risk. It's unclear if breast density increases the risk of breast cancer or whether it's just harder to find. And then obviously anybody who's had chest radiation, let's say they had leukemia or lymphoma uh, when they were young or needed chest radiation, that increases that risk. And again, there's one risk tool and I gave you another one uh, later on. Next slide. Um, again, once again, showing the disparity that we have uh, based on race and ethnicity in our country with higher rates of death in the um, Black um, population. Next slide. So let's do some cases. So a 45-year-old comes in for an annual exam, no family history. She wonders if she should get breast cancer screening, and if so, how often? And so you can either do it annually starting now, every two years starting now, annually starting at age 50, every two years starting at age 50, or really, I have no idea. So I'm going to keep going to the next case. And then uh, if you want to just type in chat for the answer to this one. Next slide. 78-year-old uh, comes in for annual visit. She's had mammograms annually, and they've all been normal. She's got COPD, hypertension, congestive heart failure. She has difficulty walking four blocks and she wonders, does she need a mammogram? And so really, uh, does she no longer need one? Not recommended based on her age and comorbid. Keep going or I'm not sure. Okay, let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> so what are our screening criteria? And this has also changed recently too. The U.S. Preventive Service Task Force just recently in their 2023 guidelines came up with a new recommendation that says to st start screening starting at age 40. So previously they had said discuss uh, between age 40 to 45 and discuss and consider every two years starting at age uh, 45. Uh, now they're saying do it uh, starting at age 40, 40 and do it every two years. And you can see some of the Canadian Preventive Service Task Force, American uh, Cancer Society and American College of Physicians all have different guidelines. This is why it's so confusing, okay? Almost everybody agrees that screening from age, definitely from age 50 up to 75 is when you're going to get probably, as we say, the most bang for your buck um, in terms of uh, cancer screening. So whether it's every year, every two years, again, different guidelines, 
American Cancer Society and American College of Radiology also recommend annual screening versus every two years, whereas the other ones recommend every two years. And again, that's based on a lot of modeling, based on the studies, how many cancers do they find by screening every year, the amount of radiation, and so on. In terms of the older age group, it again, really goes back to similar to colon cancer screening. Uh, you discuss the risk and benefit, how healthy are they? For our 78-year-old who can't walk four blocks, I would say there's not going to be a mortality benefit to continue mammogram screening for that patient um, because they're very frail if they can only walk four blocks. Next slide. And so why is there the controversy? Well, there's always controversy with screening. So again, a lot of the data is pooled data, which again has its issues. I'm not gonna go into statistics for you, um, but again, it's a lot of women in a younger age group, you have to screen to prevent one death, okay? And as you're younger, because the breasts are more dense typically, hard may be harder to find, you get a lot of false positives, which can lead to a lot of anxiety, unnecessary biopsies and things like that. Uh, if we go to the 50 to 59, again, you need to screen about 1300 to prevent one death. The false positive rate drops, however. And then um, when you get to the 60 to 69, Again, you only need to screen um, over 350 to prevent one death. Um, and so if you do 10 years of mammogram screening, at least 50% of women will have one false alarm. Uh, that could be a false positive. It could be something that isn't going to contribute to death or something else. Next slide. And so why the every two years? Again, controversial depending on when you look at the screening. And part of it, the controversy goes to how do people look at data and how do you interpret data? A lot of these are for, for use modeling estimates rather than sort of randomized controlled trials. And so again, differences that they find. Um, if you do biennial screening, meaning every two years, it still finds a significant amount of benefit and it reduces the false positive results. Um, mortality reduction, again, about 16.5%. Um, and also in the younger age group, uh, but it also reduced, uh, but there were more, sorry, more false positives. So most of the guidelines and the people who wrote a lot of these guidelines feel that every two-year screening achieves the most benefit with less harm than annual but again, I would leave this, and this is not high-risk individuals, different screening for high risk. Um, again, it's something to discuss. Part of the problem with every two years is you got to remember it, right? You got to remember, when did I have that? And a lot of patients don't. Um, and so also radiology tends to send out an annual um, letter to say, go get your mammogram. So again, nothing wrong with doing it every year. Guidelines say every two years for most of the guidelines, not all. And so I think it's something to discuss. Next slide. Um, this is just the Canadian study. Again, I don't want to belabor this as we go, because um, I, I want to get to our last cancer screening. So let's just go on, but you can read about this. Really says some similar things to what I've already stated. Next slide. And again, New England Journal, older study. This is from the SEER data, um, which is the epidemiology data that is national. Um, and again, if you screen, obviously you're gonna find more cancers. And if you screen early, you're still gonna find more cancers. Um, there was a decrease in late stage disease, which is part of the goal of screening is we wanna find things early to prevent death. Um, eight of the 122 early cancers were predicted to progress to advanced cancer. Um, or advanced disease. So that's actually a small percentage of what's found early that actually is gonna go on to potentially a cancer that may cause mortality. And again, there were a lot of women uh, who were overdiagnosed with breast cancer uh, in that particular study, but it did decrease death. Um, next slide. So again, I've already mentioned these, the risks of mammogram overdiagnosis, um, which is finding cancers that will not either progress or that may cause death, false positives, and then of course, risk of radiation over time. Next slide. 
And then I did just want to mention dense breasts. So we know that dense breasts are a, a slightly harder issue and um, it is recommended. And I think most radiology suites have actually gone to using only the TOMO or the 3D mammograms because they're better um, at looking at dense breasts and it has reduced the number of um, false positives and uh, reduced the need for going for biopsy when they couldn't see it. Um, so I would say if you have that available, any screening's better than no screening. I just wanna say that. So if all you have is the older mammogram, still better than not doing screening. Uh, if they have switched over to the TOMO or the 3D mammogram, probably better, especially for reducing uh, false positives, especially with dense breasts. Next slide. And so what the heck do we do? Um, well, we know that the highest value in terms of less people screen to find one cancer is in the slightly older age group. However, we are finding cancers early. So the current guidelines are recommending start younger and do it every two years. And I gave you the guideline uh, link there. Uh, the 3D MAMO or the TOMO is better for dense breasts. There does not appear to be any benefit to screen after age 80. And again, if a woman is healthy, um, then there are likely benefits. Obviously, if any woman has symptoms, pain, lumps, rashes, discharge, that is not screening, that is diagnostic workup. And so it is different. And I've given you a couple links for determining who's higher risk. Next slide, please. So we're gonna move to prostate cancer, our last one. Again, prostate cancer, also a very common cancer in men or anyone with a prostate. Um, a PSA was introduced in 1987. It was initially introduced to monitor treatment, which is why it is an imperfect test for screening, but it's the one we have right now. It is still the first choice for screening and a free PSA could be helpful if your total, so typically we order total PSA, if it is higher and that, um, according to Steve, Dr. Steve Lieberman, one of our volunteers, is actually over 1.5, then a free PSA may be helpful. There are risk calculators, which I will uh, link to in the slides, uh, may be helpful for patients who may need referral or additional testing. Next slide. So a 44-year-old man comes to clinic to establish care. He asks about prostate cancer screening, reading in the news, doesn't know his family history. And so the question is, well, what do you do? Don't screen, um, discuss the benefits, do a digital rectal exam, that's DRE, as it's better. And I don't know, that's why I am here. Let's go on. Next slide. So what we know, again, the benefit of early detection is, is according to um, Steve Lieberman, is not controversial. We know that detecting cancers early save lives. And according to him, there's no such thing as a quote unquote normal PSA. And so what he says is before appropriate share, know the risk of high grade cancer. And that's where some of those um, risk calculators can help. And then a PSA result may be helpful to discuss next steps. And not all patients with a higher PSA um, have clinically significant prostate cancer or get biopsied. But anybody with symptoms needs workup, which may include a digital rectal exam, a PSA, and other studies. So that is your, your um, men or people with prostates who are having urinary symptoms or a feeling of pressure in that area or blood. Okay, so anything that uh, may impact, especially the urinary system, is a symptom and needs workup. Next slide. Um, this is very small. So I'll just say that again, these are some of the different guidelines. AUA is Urologic Association. Um, they have their guidelines. US Preventive Task Force has their guidelines. American College of Physicians have their guidelines and the American Cancer Society have their guidelines. And all of those are confusing uh, and different. And so again, most people are saying, well, offer it, have a discussion, but I think it's really complicated. Um, and again, you may want to read some of those guidelines uh, for determining uh, what to do. Next slide. And so the question is, do you screen or you don't screen? And again, five-year survival, if the cancer is um, just in the prostate, very, very good survival. Um, 
And again, if it's advanced, then the survival benefit goes way down. Um, that is always true with almost every cancer. Um, advanced or metastatic disease is treatable, but it is usually not curable. And the morbidity and mortality of treatment associated with higher level cancers is pretty significant. Next slide. So here's one of the calculators, the risks, and I just gave it to you. You can obviously go, this is for use in men 50 or higher. And so that is one of the issues is what do you do with a younger person? Most of these calculators start at age 50. And so they don't even have a place for you to put in a younger age. Next slide. Um, and here's um, just how to look at this. So this is kind of looking at what your PSA is and then what your free PSA is. And so if you look at this, so a PSA of 2%, which is quote unquote in the normal range, but somebody has a free PSA of 25, then the probability of having any prostate cancer is about 20%. And the probability of having a high grade is about 6.7%. Now, the higher the PSA and the lower the free, your rates of actual cancer, it goes up. Okay, so here's where this can be very helpful in terms of using a free PSA based on what your initial PSA is. Okay, so um, next slide. Um, so what do you do? So I really want to encourage you. There is a talk by Dr. Lieberman. That he goes into much more detail, or you can certainly send him an e-consult if you have a question about a PSA. He loves this topic, so I'm encouraging you to do that. So he's recommending actually screening all 40-year-olds, regardless of their race or family history. And anybody who has a PSA of greater than 1.5, um, you want to think about either sending a referral to him or consult to urology, maybe getting a free PSA um, to see what to do. And then you may think about sending for um, an MRI uh, either before they get a prostate biopsy or referral or get urology input before you order that because MRIs are very expensive. And we obviously are not going to MRI everybody with an abnormal PSA. Um, so again, that's where I would say use your the consults that we have for you. Next slide, please. And then he did a, a podcast. So you can look at that on Kevin MD. Next slide. Um, and just other cancers. So I talked about the big five. Um, we have a lot of other cancers, but there are no screening criteria right now for any of these. Obviously, skin cancer, also a big cancer.